So my name is Mike Yusenda. I'm from Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, first I want to say this audience is really well informed. I've learned a lot myself. But I don't have any comment. I would like to ask you guys, uh, in a couple of days you have to say yay or nay on this. And I have two questions. One is, are you going to make that decision based upon what you hear here? And that, that's a question. There was a second. I'm looking for an answer. If, for example, if we overwhelmingly oppose this, and that's the message you walk away with, will you vote nay when you have to make your decision next week? Um, okay, we have a question. The question was, um, how do we balance the public opinion that we are soliciting now with our own sentiment? Um, and let, let me give a very big and complicated uh, question a short answer, which is, uh, we have a representative system of government, meaning you elect your representatives um, and to some extent trust their judgment. My title, unlike the senators, is representative. So the very first question I ask is, where are my constituents? The second and third questions I ask are, what are the facts that perhaps my constituents don't see or what else is out there that I need to take into account? If my constituents are very clear, and this very rarely happens. Many of the issues we've dealt with, the stimulus, the health care reform, Dodd-Frank, you know, these things were you know, some version of 60, 40, 50, 50. But if my constituents as a representative are powerfully clear in one direction, I will need an overwhelming case to override those people that I represent. I'm a representative. You should hear from the Senate. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't be here if I weren't going to take into account the way people feel and think. And I've said, uh, no secret, that I am first and foremost in Washington to advocate and fight for the people of Connecticut. And that's no different when it comes to this question. So a predominant factor, but not the only one, is going to be what people say here, what they've said to me in Bridgewater and Hebron and Groton and literally I've been all around the state of Connecticut talking about this issue. Okay, let, okay, so then as I... Let, uh, me, let me just finish my, my answer. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Powell Doctrine. They told me to say something. Go ahead. They told you to say something? Okay. <laughs> Is it, uh, yes, my turn. Should I talk or you talk? Well, let me just finish. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm still a junior member of the Senate, so I was here. Uh, let me just finish, though, because maybe it'll affect what you say. Uh, Colin Powell, a very well-respected military leader, and some may not have the regard for him uh, that everyone uh, might, but let me just say he had a number of conditions, a condition that had, have to be met before our nation resorts to military force and war. And I won't bore you with all of them, but one of them is that we define our objectives and make sure that the objectives are achievable by military force. And the last two are that we have the international community with us, that we have some support from the world, and the last, which I think is maybe the most important, is the American people have to support it. No government, no president can resort to military force and prolonged military action if the American people are against it. We know that from recent history, don't we? Whatever we think about the merits here, and even for the folks who are passionately believers that we should use military force, the lessons of history are that American opinion, American support are vital in the long term because after all, we can't be waging war without it. And that's what Colin Powell said, and it may state the obvious, but it's one of the reasons why what you say here is very important. 